We continue today our study of the sacraments as they are presented in the Westminster Confession of Faith, taking up today the most precious of all, namely the Lord's Supper. But before we do so, let us pray for the Lord's blessing. We thank Thee for this unspeakable institution, Lord Jesus Christ, in Thine own body and blood, which Thou hast commanded we should observe until the end of the age. What a privilege! And how we pray that as we study it, we may understand what it is and what Thou dost accomplish by means of it, what it is not and what must be avoided in the administration of it, that we may treat Thy sacred supper with all the love, affection, and respect which we treat Thee who hath instituted it in Thine own body and blood. In Thy dear name we pray, amen. Chapter 29 of the Lord's Supper, the first section reads, Our Lord Jesus, in the night wherein He was betrayed, instituted the sacrament of His body and blood called the Lord's Supper, to be observed in His church unto the end of the world, for the perpetual remembrance of the sacrifice of Himself in His death, the sealing of all benefits thereof unto true believers, their spiritual nourishment and growth in Him, their further engagement in and to all duties which they owe unto Him, and to be a bond and pledge of their communion with Him and with each other as members of His mystical body. Remember, in a preceding chapter, Westminster Confession had discussed the communion of the saints and explained that that was a participating in Jesus Christ commonly, so that we who participated in Him, had communion with Him, have thereby communion with those others who likewise have communion with Him. Now that is a general concept, all pervasive, pertaining to our entire lives. Every day we have communion with Him. We receive His strength and endeavor by His grace to carry out His will. But the communion of the Lord's Supper is a very special institution and a very special means of communion. We even call it the communion, as if it were the only aspect of this fellowship, whereas it is merely the principal way of communing with Him. You know, there were literally thousands and thousands of lambs which were slain in anticipation of the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God, when He came, knew that He came to die. He had fixed His face as a flint to go to Jerusalem where He was going to be delivered up. And as He said when He instituted this supper, with desire have I desired to have this Passover with you. That's an amazing statement. When you realize that He was sweating drops of blood at the mere anticipation of the grueling death of the next day, yet with desire He desired to have this first communion with His apostles. He desired it because even though He shrank from it in horror and cried out, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, because He knew it was not possible, unless He had a love which would let us go, it was not possible for Him to avoid the awful wrath of God in our stead. Why then the desire for this indescribable agony and death of the cross, except for the fact that it was His most intimate communion with His disciples? 
It was the climax of his perfect and everlasting love for them. It was the incomparable demonstration of how deeply he was committed to them, that he didn't even shrink from the cross and even rejoiced as he made his way through the valley of the shadow of death because that was the basis of the everlasting salvation of those whom he loved so much that he would die for them. So this was very precious to him, and it is also the most precious possible experience which we can ever have because it's in his body and his blood, and he alone could properly institute it, as indeed he was pleased and indeed happy to do, even though he had a sorrow unto death. I take it that expression, he had sorrow unto death, means that he was literally so sad at the thought of the agony and death about to be accomplished that the mere anticipation of it almost killed him. You know, we read that in the garden he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, that word drops of thromboy, from which we get our word thrombosis. In other words, at the mere thought of this cup of suffering and death that he was about to take, blood coursed so mightily through his veins that his sadness was virtually unto death, and if those thromboi, as it were, had not, as it were, poured out of his body, he would undoubtedly have been killed by the sheer distress and agitation of his soul at the thought of a suffering beyond any human comparison conceivable. Nevertheless, with desire, he desired to establish this supper, and it is our privilege to participate in his desire. It reminds us, the confession does, once again, that it is a sign, being a sacrament, and also a seal. That is, it very visibly and movingly demonstrates that broken body, that poured out blood necessary for the remission of our sins. And at the same time, inasmuch as it was instituted by God himself, it's not a product of human piety. It's not a spontaneous reaction of gratitude on our part. Though, of course, any pious heart would indeed come joyfully to this communion. It would be impossible to be grateful for Christ without being willing to express it in any possible manner. Nevertheless, it is not our creation or response of our piety, but it is actually an institution of our Savior, which means it has a divine stamp upon it, which signifies, as the confession indicates, that all who truly believe it, that is, genuinely discern it, realize they're not merely going through a form, they're not masticating bread and drinking wine, but are actually communing in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, who himself is fellowshipping with us on the occasion, those persons really do receive all the wonderful benefits which you have just heard me read. And by implication, though it isn't stated here at this particular moment, if we do not discern the Lord's body and do not therefore receive it worthily, that is understanding that we are in desperate need of it and he is an in infinite love to bestow it and so on, then, of course, we eat and drink, as the scripture says, condemnation or damnation to ourselves. But if we do discern the Lord's body and really trust in him who shed his blood for the remission of our sins, then, of course, all these benefits, these unspeakable benefits, come immediately to our soul as in no other encounter we ever have in this world. Number two says, in this sacrament, Christ is not offered up to his Father, nor any real sacrifice made at all for remission of sins of the quick or dead, but a commemoration of that once offering up of himself by himself upon the cross, once for all. 
and a spiritual oblation of all possible praise unto God for the same, so that the so-called sacrifice of the Mass is most contradictory to Christ's own sacrifice, the only propitiation for all the sins of the elect. The substance of what was originally delivered by these Westminster divines in 1647 is, as has usually been the case, preserved here, though certain expressions about how very injurious the Roman Mass actually is have been deleted. But it's clear, nevertheless, that Rome is repudiated in calling this a sacrifice. There is no such thing as a sacrifice of the Mass. A sacrifice was made on the cross once for all. What we do when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, if we observe it as he instituted it, is commemorate. We do this in remembrance of him. It's a recollection and a re-experience of what he has done for us. It is not a re-sacrifice of him. Some Roman theologians agree with us and have a real problem. A man named Caponigri, for example, edited a volume some years ago in which there are at least three essays by Roman theologians trying to get away from this awful onus of their own doctrine of the sacrifice of the Mass and trying, if there's any possible way, I had all kinds of sympathy with them. I think they failed in the endeavor, but I give them A for the effort to get away if it's possible from construing this language and historic, historical position of the sacrifice of the Mass as something other than a repetition of what Christ did on the cross. I don't think it's possible as long as that doctrine is maintained and Westminster is saying it is very injurious and utterly improper. Inasmuch as that sacrifice was finished on the cross, it was once for all, and what we do is commemorate what was done and communicate with the benefits which were procured by what was done. In this sacrament, Christ is not offered up to his Father. This is not an oblation. This is not a sacrifice. I've administered this communion many times myself, and I never offered Christ up as a sacrifice. He did that for me and for you on the cross. Nor is it any real sacrifice. That is, we're not repeating the sacrifice in the Mass or the communion. There is the sacrifice has been made. In no sense an oblation. In no sense is the priest re-killing the sacrificial paschal lamb. None of that is appropriate after Christ came and died and completed that sacrifice on the cross. This is not for the remission of sins. That was accomplished by the shedding of Christ's blood. But it is a commemoration of that once offering up of himself by himself, not by me, not by any other minister, not by any priest. Christ the priest offered the sacrifice which was Christ himself. And once and for all, upon the cross, not on a Roman altar and not on a communion table. And a spiritual oblation is a spiritual oblation in the sense that we are offering up ourselves along with him when we do come to his communion table. We died with him, we rose with him, and we are celebrating our union with him even in death. So that if there's any oblation at all, it's the oblation of ourselves. As he once gave himself up for us, we are now repeatedly all our lives, but consummately in the communion service, offering ourselves up unto him. Section 3 reads this way. The Lord Jesus hath in this ordinance appointed his ministers to declare his word of institution to the people, to pray and bless the elements of bread and wine, and thereby to set them apart from a common to and holy use, and to take and break the bread, to take the cup, and then communicating also themselves to give both to the communicants, but to none who are not then present in the congregation. 
Here again, the specifications of a proper communion order is spelled out. The minister should pray, and the minister should bless the elements, not as if he is thereby changing them through some sort of transubstantiation from bread into something else or from the wine into something else, but he blesses them to change them from their ordinary use as you eat bread at a table in an ordinary meal or as you drink uh, w- wine or grape juice on some occasion. But this wine, this bread is set aside for a very special purpose. And all a minister does when he asks for God's blessing is that God will use this bread and this cup in an extraordinary way as bread and wine is not ordinarily used. There's no transformation. Nothing happens to the bread. It's still the bread that was provided originally. It's the same cup that you would drink at an ordinary uh, meal. And of course, the meaning of that is perfectly obvious to, uh, to everyone. You'll notice also that the minister participates in both elements. In Roman practice, you know, there's a withholding of the cup and only the priest receives the cup while only the wafer or the bread of the communion is administered to the parishioner. That, too, is contrary to the original pattern and that, too, is contrary to what was specified here where the minister, together with the people, while he... This is the conception of a minister in the Protestant service here. The minister is indeed in the role of Christ. That is, Christ originally instituted this, and then he appointed me and other ordained ministers to administer it in his name on this particular occasion. So in that sense, we are carrying out a role that he would carry out were he here. Now, the second role we have is that we are members of the pew too. We are recipients just as well. We are as absolutely dependent upon his once-for-all sacrifice as anybody to whom we administer the communion. So we have a dual role here of blessing and administering as he has commanded, as he would himself do, but at the same time we are the recipients exactly as those to whom we administer it. So we receive the cup as well as the bread, the bread as well as the cup. They communicating also to themselves to give both to the communicants. But notice this final statement, to none who are not then present in the congregation. Now, here is an area where Protestantism has deviated in, the pa- in practice, though, again, I haven't noticed a fundamental change in the confession on that particular detail. It's just referring, of course, to the privacy of the Mass and the claim that the Roman Church makes to a privilege of administering it privately. As I said on another occasion when we were discussing the sacraments, Rome allows even a non-Christian to administer the baptism to someone and so on, and not in the church or anything like that necessary, though ideally done by a priest in the sanctuary. But Protestantism, as, as well as this Reformed tradition which we're reading here and so on, takes the position that this is a congregational activity. This is to be done by all the people of God in that particular parish. All should be there, and they all should proceed appropriately under the direction of the uh, minister. And it's not to be done privately. Masses aren't to be given privately. And I say many uh, Protestants today do that, especially for the sick who are unable to come to church anymore. Now, there's a nice question whether that would be uh, tenable or not. I myself have administered it. And I've always been authorized, and most Protestant churches authorize their minister under those circumstances uh, to do it. But I've always explained to people, first of all, to the person who cannot come bodily, I will not administer to him privately if he's able physically to be present at the public service, to be sure. But even when he or she is unable to come to the service, the first thing I explain to make perfectly clear And it is not necessary for them to receive the Lord's Supper. It is the choicest privilege possible, to be sure, but Christ communicates himself to people without the sacrament, and their nourishment doesn't depend upon it so that they are deprived of spiritual comfort unless they receive the Mass, just as we say with respect to baptism. Baptism should be public, never private. And if it ever is authorized privately, it ought to be made very clear from our principles, which are contrary to Roman principles on this matter, that it isn't absolutely necessary. A person's salvation doesn't depend upon it. 
If I don't get there in time to baptize somebody who cried out in, in belief in the last moments of his life before he actually dies, he's not lost. That's what we have to say. Now, you see, Augustine and some other great theologians just don't agree with us on that, and they actually think unless the person is a recipient of baptism, he's lost. <clears throat> Rome tries to get away from that. I, I really wouldn't, couldn't tell you what Rome's official position is on that. But anyway, as far as the basic principle is concerned, the sacraments are all for the congregation. The baptism, the Lord's Supper alike, and so this is the traditional position. And if we are going to deviate from it at all, we ought to be very careful to make it clear that this is not the proper function, it's only strictly an emergency, and is in no sense of the word necessary. And in that sense of the way, if you can convince invalids and so on, that it's not necessary, and it would really better, be better to forego the privilege, I think you ought to try to do that. But if nevertheless they feel lonely and cut off from communion, and especially this particular practice, and you can satisfy the government of your church, that it's legal under such conditions, with such specifications, to administer the communion privately, then perhaps. But certainly Westminster does not state it here. Section 4 reads, Private masses or receiving this sacrament by a priest or any other alone, as likewise the denial of the cup to the people, worshiping the elements, the lifting them up. See, lifting them up means there's an oblation, a sacrifice. Therefore, an impertinence and a sacrilege because a sacrifice has been made once and for all. I don't think, as I recall, there's anything here that talks about this, but there's a point of conviction here. The minister should always stand behind the communion table. It is a communion table. It is not an altar. An altar is a place where sacrifices are made. And if the altar is in front of me and I am facing it with my back to the congregation, that's the symbolism of a sacrifice. And it is utterly consistent with the Roman view of things because they do think they are engaging in the sacrifice of the Mass. As we've indicated already, that is an impertinence and an injustice, and it's injurious to the cause of Jesus Christ, so to do so. And if we, therefore, practice the habit of calling the communion table an altar and then take a further step and face it with our backs to the people, we are carrying out a symbolism which contradicts our actual principles. So it ought to be very careful that it be a communion table and the minister be behind it, distributing to the people the sacrifice which was once for all made by him on the cross. So the lifting up of them or carrying them about for adoration, reserving them for any pretended religious use are all contrary to the nature of the sacrament and to the institution of Christ. It's still bread. It's still wine or grape juice. It's not the body of Christ. It is not the blood of Christ. And you act accordingly. If you think it is the body of Christ, as Rome erroneously teaches, or you think it is the blood of Christ, then you can see how a person would have that kind of awe and respect, and oblations would be involved. Now, if that is not the case, as Westminster rightly says, then, of course, we act, ought to act accordingly. If there's any bread left over after the communion, we'd eat it just as we would other bread. We'll put the wine back in the bottle and use it for ordinary consumption. It is set aside for a special use, and when the use is passed, it resumes its normal use, and so on. We remember that. This matter of symbolism, you know, and behavior is very important because it does express the fundamental principle. If the principle is that the sacrifice is finished, then there ought not to be any symbolism which suggests a continuation of the sacrifice. If the teaching is that this bread is just set aside for a special use at that time and only for that, then we should act accordingly. And I will say this for Rome. She acts according to her principles. Her principles are wrong, but the consistency of her behavior with reference to those wrong principles is utterly thorough. No doubt about that. Much more so than most Protestants. Protestants will much more frequently lapse into inconsistent behavior with right principles. Well, Rome almost invariably acts with consistent behavior toward wrong principles. Number five, the outward elements in this sacrament, duly set apart to the uses ordained by Christ, have such relation to him crucified as that truly, yet 
sacramentally only, they are sometimes called by the name of the things they represent. They're called the blood of Christ. They're called the body of Christ, you see. Albeit in substance and nature, they still remain truly and only bread and wine as they were before. Do you get that point? You can see Protestantism has always recognized John 6 and Christ's language so thoroughly stated and almost barbarically sounded, sounding as if it were cannibalistic, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in your cell. Well, that's his flesh. That's his blood. In a certain very real but sacramental sense only. He was never devoured by his disciples even when he was incarnate and among them. And he isn't devoured and masticated by us now that he's at the right hand of God in heaven. But nevertheless, this is what Section 5 is trying to say, nevertheless, there is a real, though sacramental, sense in which his body and his blood is communicated to us. Our redemption is no other way than by his incarnation and suffering in flesh and blood for the remission of our sins. It's mystical and sacramental. It's not real and substantial, but it is genuine and true and religious experience. But so what Westminster is saying to us, don't shy away from the very, very strong language here. There is a sense in which you are eating his flesh and drinking his blood, as he himself used it. But the sense he himself me makes perfectly clear is that you truly rest in him. You receive the benefits of the blood he shed for you and the body which he died for you. Section 6 says, the doctrine which maintains a change of the substance of bread and wine into the substance of Christ's body and blood, commonly called transubstantiation, by consecration of a priest or by any other way, is repugnant, not to Scripture alone, but even to common sense and reason, overthroweth the nature of the sacrament, and hath been and is the cause of manifold superstitions, yea, of gross idolatries." You see the, why that final word idolatry comes in? If actually that is on that table, the very body and blood of Jesus Christ, the only way in which Christ ever had flesh and blood was as incarnate deity. And consequently, that flesh, that blood would be inseparable from the incarnate Son of God and worthy of worship the very kind of worship and oblation, adoration, which you see some traditions actually giving. But if that is just bread and wine, mere creatures used for a divine purpose, then to treat it as if it were God, that is nothing less than idolatry. You're literally worshiping a piece of bread. You're genuflecting before and holding sacred a cup of wine. That's idolatry. If I had a Roman priest here talking with me, he would agree with me completely. If there's no transubstantiation, Westminster's quite right, he would say. You ought to treat that as mere bread and mere wine. And I would agree with him. But if there is a transubstantiation, he's quite consistent in his behavior. So the argument's clearly drawn. And what we're saying to you is if you agree with Westminster as a sound exposition of Scripture, no such thing as transubstantiation ever occurs, then you should act accordingly, and anybody who acts contrarywise is guilty of not only superstition, but actually idolatry. I'm sorry we don't have time to go into that passage, this is my body, which our Lord uses, which are the most controverted words in language, incidentally, but that's part of the reason we don't have time for it. It's such a major subject in itself. Number seven, and we must, uh, this concludes the treatment of the Lord's Supper, and I'll read this and make just the briefest comment because our time is up. Worthy receivers, outwardly partaking of the visible elements in this sacrament, do then also inwardly by faith, really and indeed, yet not carnally and corporally, but spiritually, receive and feed upon Christ crucified. And all benefits of his death, the body and blood of Christ being then not corporally or carnally in with or under the bread and wine, yet 
as really but spiritually present to the faith of believers in that ordinance as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. So don't forget in all the controversy of the ages, and I say that very expression, this is my body, has been the most controverted four words in human history, and so on. Don't miss the main event. There is a real live communion with Jesus Christ. There is one more statement here. I'm sorry. uh, Let me read it, though. Although ignorant and wicked men receive the outward elements in this sacrament, yet they receive not the thing signified, but by their unworthy coming thereunto are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord and bring judgment on themselves. The old language was damnation. Wherefore, all ignorant and ungodly persons, as they are unfit to enjoy communion with him, so are they unworthy of the Lord's table, and cannot, without great sin against Christ, while they remain such, partake of these holy mysteries, or be admitted thereunto. You know, the ultimate key of the church is excommunication barring someone from the sacred table. And Westminster's ending on that note. This table is open to God's children only, and God's children walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If anyone is walking wickedly, he has no access to this table. He has no right to membership in the Christian church. He should be excommunicated if he will not repent. Now, if any of you are living that way, take warning, and at the same time, listen to our exhortation to repent and believe and sit down and partake of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ with all true believers. May God bless you to that end.